computer. Right, we're recording now. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, there is so much material to talk about. It's really quite difficult um, to know where to start. And it's also quite difficult to know where to pitch this because there will be um, some of you um, who will have led a SEDA for decades, every year for decades. And there will be some people who uh, this year, uh, it's looking likely that we'll be locked in and therefore we'll be running a SEDA for the very first time. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to know really um, where to pitch uh, this and what to talk about because there's so much to talk about. So I thought I'd start um, with the, uh, hang on, somebody's got a chat. Uh, Max's iPad in the UK. Hope you're all okay. Who's Max? Anyway, thank you, Max. Um, so I thought I'd start um, really by uh, talking about the preparation. Johnny, yes, Johnny, that, that's that's Max Bayer from London, ah. and he lives here. Oh right, you say that's Max. Okay, I don't know if Max. Oh, Dr. Got, got Max Bayer. Yeah, yeah, I know who you mean. Yes, Max is with us, but I can't see him on my screen. I've got a chat from him that says, hope you're all okay. Thank you, Max. Welcome if you are here. I can't see you on our screen. Uh, can I? No, I could. Oh yeah, there you are, Max. Hello, Max. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, let's go back to uh, that screen there. Right. So, um, we have uh, um, 31 people joined, but uh, quite a few of you are doubles. So, we're probably... I don't know, 40 or 50 people. So you'll all have very different experiences um, of uh, preparing for Pesach and uh, running a Seder. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about some, some very general things and then um, specific things. But please feel free to ask any questions that arise and um, I'll do my best to, to answer them. So I thought I'd start, first of all, with the uh, preparations for Pesach. Um, uh, which uh, obviously uh, involve clearing out the chametz. And we have this concept of selling chametz and burning our uh, residual chametz. Now, in order to fully understand um, uh, what's going on here, we need to put it into a historical context. Because one of the uh, complaints, if you like, uh, that some people have about uh, our wonderful religion is that it's full of tricks and it's full of uh, loopholes. And, uh, you know, if we find something that doesn't suit us, then we just, uh, you know, work our way around it. And a lot of people are not happy with this concept of selling the chametz. Um, and uh, again, we have to put this into its historical context. Right. Yes. The Torah tells us um, that we have to get rid of all our chametz, um, all our leaven, anything which is uh, capable of becoming leaven uh, or causes things to become leaven, so sa'ar, which is uh, sourdough, um, anything which causes rising of the, uh, chamet, of the flour and water uh, is called chametz, and we have to get rid of all that for, um, for the entirety of Pesach. Now, there is... There, are a, there is a library full of books as to what chametz is all about, why we have to get rid of it. Uh, I'm not going to go into that uh, right now, although um, that can be uh, the, 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 the subject of another discussion if we like. But the, the Torah tells us we have to get rid of our chametz, and for, in seven days instead we have to uh, use uh, matzah, which is... Uh, flour and water which has not risen and is the baking process is completed within 18 minutes. Now, getting rid of our chametz um, back in the day before, really not that long ago, if we think about even uh, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, let's say, was not all that difficult because there were no fridges, there were no um, preservatives in food. Um, I remember my mum, who's not 150 years old yet, um, telling me that when she first married, which was in 1952, um, she used to go shopping every single day. Now, for us, that sounds a bit 
um, a bit strange really for, for us younger people um, uh, because we were all brought up uh, at a time where there were supermarkets. Well, there were no supermarkets in the UK in 1952. So my mum tootled off to the greengrocers and to the butchers and to the bakers. Uh, and she said that when she first got married, she, she went shopping every day. Uh, and that really is a demonstration that even um, 60 odd years ago, uh, we didn't have huge amounts of food in our house to get rid of. Uh, because we sort of ate on a sort of daily basis. We shopped on a daily basis or on a twi every couple of days. Uh, we might have had a larder. We might have had a pantry. We might have even had an ice box. Um, but go back a bit further. We certainly never had fridges. And there was, it wasn't that difficult to actually get rid of any chametz. Now, the other thing that, that, uh, that has happened uh, over a period of time is that the word chametz has got uh, expanded into meaning anything which doesn't have a hechsher on it for Pesach, which is not correct. Chametz is stuff which is made out of flour and water which has risen. So what we would now call proper chametz is bread uh, or bread products, pasta, uh, those kind of things. What else? What else is proper chametz? Whiskey, beer, things which have uh, uh, risen. Hang on, let me just turn that off. Um, so that is what we call proper chametz, and that is what you have to get rid of. Proper chametz. Now, um, so bearing in mind those two facts, one that we now store much, much more food. We did, we've got fridges, we've got freezers. We've got foods with preservatives in them. We store far, far more food than we ever did. And we also, uh, over a period of time, although we're trying to re uh, redress this balance, really, we have, over a period of time, become obsessed with getting rid of stuff which we don't really need to get rid of because it's not proper chametz. Uh, we've got to the stage where getting rid of chametz has become quite difficult because we have to, what my wife calls, run the freezer down. I'm sure all of you will recognize that, uh, that expression. I can see Helen uh, uh, smiling there. Yeah, we have to run the freezer down. Um, and we start that running the freezer down round about Shavuos of the previous year, right? Uh, or, you know, usually at least at Purim, we start to run the freezer down. Um, so uh, it, it's more complicated now than it used to be. The other thing that's more complicated, of course, is that we have stuff uh, which is chametz, which is very valuable. Back in the day, we didn't have any valuable chametz. I'm talking about bottles of whiskey. Uh, I've got a, a pal in, in England who, uh, who deals in whiskey. That's his, uh, one of his hobbies, is he deals in whiskey. And he's got bottles of whiskey there that are worth thousands of pounds. Well, you know, you can't pour that down the sink or down your throat. You've got to, you know, that's a part of an investment, but you're not allowed to own it on Pesach. So we had to devise some kind of system for uh, keeping the halacha whilst uh, working and living in the modern age. Uh, and whilst uh, there are, I think, uh, reasonable objections um, that people have to uh, selling the chametz, and, and I think the, the argument that it's a, uh, it's a swizz and it's a trick and it's not really a sale and all that stuff, I think that's a valid argument and it needs to be addressed. On the other hand, I think what's really important is that the halacha uh, has, able, has been able to be changed over the centuries and has been modernized over the centuries to accommodate things which the original halacha could not possibly have imagined. When the, uh, when the, the halacha uh, was first um, uh, set out in the Mishnah uh, in uh, around about 200 of the current era, and then discussed in the Gemara around about uh, 300 years later, there was certainly no uh, um, uh, need for people to run down the freezer. Uh, and there was certainly uh, very little in the way of uh, uh, merchandise, uh, which would which needed to be got rid of, uh, uh, which was expensive, uh, and as the need for that arose, so the halacha um, uh, dynamized, it changed, it adapted, and this is something which we should applaud. 
So uh, uh, th there's many, many other things that we, we, we need to dynamize and, and adapt. And the one that comes to mind, obviously, is the situation with Agunot. Um, we, haven't quite, uh, we haven't quite been as sophisticated with our halachic thinking with Agunot yet, as we have with Chametz. Um, but it needs to happen. But the concept, what I want to, the point that I want to make is the concept of uh, bringing in new ways of keeping the halacha is something, uh, the concept of that is something that we should applaud, um, even if we think that perhaps, you know, it's a bit of a loophole. Now, uh, it, it, it mustn't be a loophole, and I'm, I'm still talking about selling chametz. It mustn't be a loophole. It must be a complete sale. Uh, and to that end, there are various things that I want to just mention, um, which we must stick to. Number one, you can only sell something which somebody would want to buy. So if you have a half-eaten sandwich in your cupboard and you say, I don't need to worry about that because I'm going to sell it. Well, you can't. Nobody wants your half-eaten sandwich. Nobody's going to buy it. It's not worth anything. So therefore, you can't sell it. So... Uh, if you have a half-eaten sandwich, you cannot sell it. You have to get rid of it some way. I remember when the kids were at school, it was a ritual uh, before Pesach to go through their school bags and to empty them, and you would find their goodness knows how many half-eaten sandwiches or moldy things that they'd not bothered to take out of their bags. Uh, I'm sure I, I, I can see some people smiling there. You've obviously had the same experience. Um, and uh, 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 so those cannot be sold. So you can, the first thing is you can only sell something which uh, has a value. Uh, number two, the person that you're selling it to, even though you don't actually know the identity of that person, um, that person has every right to come into your house, uh, well, to knock on the door at least, you can have to, uh, and then to ask you for that chametz during the Pesach because it does not belong to you. And therefore, you have to, when you sell the chametz, you have to um, tell the rav who is uh, selling it on your behalf um, where your chametz is, because you've got to put it all in one place, because you can't have the guy coming along and saying, well, there's a bottle of whiskey in that cupboard, and there's uh, something else in the, in the fridge over there. You've got to have it all in the same place so that the person that's bought it can come and uh, get it from you. I'm just going to unmute uh, Jonathan and Hillary because they've got their hand up. Yes. Uh, Johnny, a serious question. I understand a bit about the sandwich, but just supposing you've got half a packet of cheese or, or half a packet, a packet of, of rice. rice. Uh, we can't use one. No. Okay. But, yeah, right. yeah, sorry. sorry. Cheese, if you've got right. half a packet, then are you saying that's the same as the, as the sandwich or has that got value type? Okay, thing? Let, let me answer that question in two right. parts. Okay, so the question was, what about a half packet of cheese or a half packet of rice? Well, the first thing to say is that cheese is not chametz, and therefore you don't have to get rid of it at all. You got a, that's exactly what I was saying to you right at the beginning when I said that we've expanded this idea of chametz to mean anything that doesn't have a hechsher on it. Cheese is not chametz unless you have got bits of bread on it from when you made your cheese sandwich then cheese is not chametz, you don't have to get rid of it. Let's take your second example, a half a packet of rice. Rice is not chametz. Even for Ashkenazim, rice is not chametz. Rice is kitniot. There is no halacha that says you have to get rid of kitniot. If you have a half a packet of rice, put it in your cupboard and don't use it on Pesach. You do not sell your full packets of rice and you don't sell your half packets of rice. Rice is kitniot, it is not chametz, it does not need to be sold. The only thing that we are selling is what we would today call proper chametz. Uh, I don't like to use that expression, but I'm using it so that you will understand what I mean. Chametz is chametz. The only thing is chametz is things that are made of the five grains mixed with water, which have risen and have not been made into matzot within 18 minutes. That is chametz. So bread, pasta, uh, what else, El? Barley, beer, hops, whiskey, those kind of things are chametz. Those are what you're selling. You're not selling cheese, 
Vinegar is another thing. Malt vinegar. Malt vinegar is another proper chametz. These are the things you're selling. You're not selling rice. You're not selling cheese. Okay? So if you had a half packet of pasta, that would be a better question. What about your half packet of pasta? Well, I would say, yes, a half packet of pasta does not have value. And therefore, you should not be selling a half packet of pasta. If you've got a half packet of pasta, use it up before Pesach. Run down your pasta like you run down your freezer. Okay, don't leave a... And if you do have a bit, then you can put it on one side and you can get rid of it, Erev Pesach, when you burn your chametz. You can't really buy, sell a half packet of pasta because nobody really wants to buy your half packet of pasta. Um, okay. So, um, where were we? Yes, so we're, selling our, we're talking about selling our chametz. You have to have it in one place so that the person that comes to, uh, to, uh, to, to get it from you, who's bought it, can get it. And there are communities, and I've heard of this uh, directly from my uh, son, uh, there are communities where the rabbi of the community brings the, the non-Jewish person who has bought the chametz randomly. Every year he brings him randomly to one person's house uh, on Cholamod Pesach. Nobody knows who it's going to be. Even the rabbi doesn't know who it's going to be until he decides who it's going to be. And he knocks on the door and the non-Jew asks to uh, see his chametz, please. I, 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 might want some, uh, you know, I might want a bottle of whiskey. I've bought this whiskey. I've given a, a, a deposit for this whiskey. I'd like to see it. I'd like to buy it. I'd like to uh, complete the sale. Uh, I want my whiskey, please, or whatever it is that he wants. Uh, and he does that deliberately to demonstrate to the community that this is a proper sale. This is not a messing about trick that you're not really selling it. You are really selling it. And you're selling it to this person who has every right to come to, to you and to get it. During the Pesach, all you are doing is you are storing his chametz. And you have to understand and you have to uh, know that you are storing the non-Jews chametz. Otherwise, it doesn't work. If you don't consider it a sale and the non-Jew does not consider that he has bought it or given a deposit for it, then it doesn't count and you are then in danger of keeping chametz on Pesach, which is an Isur Dioraita, it's a Torah law, uh, and uh, that's a very important thing that you shouldn't do. So that is the, uh, the, the concept about uh, selling chametz. So just to summarize on that, you're selling only chametz, you're not selling kidney up, you're not selling uh, uh, things which don't have a heksha, which don't have chametz in them. And secondly, you can't sell something that doesn't have value, get rid of it in another way, eat it or burn it on Erev Pesach. Uh, before I go on, uh, is there any questions on the concept of selling chametz? Any questions on that? Let me just have a look. Everyone got their hand up? No. Okay. Let's move on then from selling chametz. Now, what about bedikat chametz? Bedikat chametz. That is, oh, Johnny Halpern's got his hand up. Hang on a second. Yes, Johnny? A full packet of pasta. Can you keep it in the flat or not? You, a full you, new packet of pasta. A full new packet of pasta you can keep in your chametz cupboard and you can sell it. You can okay. sell it because somebody yeah, yeah. might want to buy a full packet of chametz, so that, of yeah. pasta. So a full packet of pasta uh, you can keep in your, uh, in your chametz cupboard locked up and in fact, what you will be doing is you're storing it for the non-Jew who, uh, who has bought it. Okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul. Hang on, I need to unmute you. There you go. I just wanted to add, not only are you breaking the halakha if you don't sell it, more, worse still almost is you can't use it after person. Okay, that's a good point. That's a very good point indeed. Uh, thank you for raising that. There is a, a concept of chametz she'avar alav ha-pesach. That means chametz, which has been owned by a Jew on Pesach. Uh, this is not a dioraita. This is a durabanan, but a, a rabbinic law that chametz, which has been owned by a Jew on Pesach, is what we call asur bahana'a. It is forbidden to have any benefit from it. So not only can you not eat it after Pesach, you can't sell it, you can't even give it to somebody, 
um, except anonymously. Um, because, and, and the person you give it to has to be a non-Jew. Uh, the, the reason for that is it's what the reason that the rabbinic uh, law came into effect was it was a knas, if you like, it was a fine. We talked about the fines in the Gemara Shia yesterday. Um, it's a fine. The Rabbanan introduced a fine because what they found that what people were doing was not doing this sale properly. And, and therefore, uh, after Pesach, they said, okay, well, I didn't do it properly, but never mind. It's okay. Pesach's over now and I've still got my expensive whiskey or what have you. Uh, they brought in a halacha that said, no, chametz she'avar alava Pesach, asur bahana'a. Chametz that's been kept by a Jew over Pesach is forbidden uh, to have any benefit of it. Now, whilst Paul has mentioned that, which is a very important point, uh, that brings us to uh, another uh, interesting point, which we'll, I'll just uh, go on to before we talk about Bedikat Chametz. Um, the, uh, if you, we, we had a situation uh, here uh, in, uh, uh, I don't want to use any names, but in our area, we had a situation uh, a couple of years ago where there was a certain bakery um, which um, was found to have started baking their uh, post-Pesach bread uh, to, to beat the queues and to beat the rush. Uh, they'd started to bake it uh, an hour or two before Pesach went out. Very naughty, uh, but that's what they did. Uh, the problem with that was not only the fact that this uh, bread had been baked on uh, Yom Tov, this was now chametz, which had been owned by a Jew on Pesach. And when we went after Pesach to this bakery um, to buy the first stock on the shelves, um, we had a problem because we were buying uh, chametz, which had been owned by a Jew on Pesach because they had got stuck into baking um, before uh, Pesach was out. So uh, you've got to be careful. And that's why uh, people who are particular about these things will certainly in the first days or so, uh, be careful about where they buy their post uh, Pesach Chametz to make sure that uh, there's no uh, danger that they are benefiting from Chametz, which has been owned by a Jew on Pesach. Now, this is why uh, it, it ties in nicely. Thank you, Paul, for bringing it up because it ties in nicely with what I was saying before. Why did they, the, 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 the main reason that the concept of selling Chametz uh, was brought in was basically for. Um, liquor merchants. Back in the day, uh, I don't know if it was whiskey, but they certainly had all sorts of um, beers and uh, mead and all sorts of, uh, of um, distilled uh, things, some of which were made from the five grains, hops, barley, malt, all those kind of things. Um, and there were people who owned factories of these things. And um, one of those, uh, one of the problems was that if you didn't sell this, uh, this if you didn't sell your factory or you didn't sell your warehouse full of this liquor, which you were a, a liquor merchant, then you couldn't sell it afterwards because it was chametz shavar alava pesach. It was chametz which you had owned, you a Jew had owned um, over uh, pesach, and it was therefore forbidden uh, to get any benefit from it. You couldn't sell it. So that was the main um, uh, stimulus, if you like. Somebody's got their phone on. There we go. Um, that was the main stimulus for bringing in the uh, selling comments. Because, uh, and it was a, there was a very interesting, interesting story. I don't know whether this story is a true or whether it is uh, only apocryphal. But there was a story of a fellow who um, was, uh, and actually the story I heard, the story I heard was in South, uh, in South Africa, uh, that a, uh, a man owned a liquor factory, I think it was whiskey or whatever it was, some kind of chametz liquor, and he was not a religious Jew and he didn't sell his chametz. And then he passed away and it 
uh, he left this factory to his son, who was a Baal Tshuva, he was a religious Jew. And this guy's got a problem now, because he now has a factory or a warehouse full of liquor that he's not allowed any benefit from. And we were talking like millions and millions of pounds. Um, uh, and this was Astor Bahana'a. This was uh, forbidden for him to use, forbidden for him to sell. I don't know the end of the story. Uh, I don't know whether they found a way out for him, but it was a serious issue. So um, uh, the fact is, it's a proper sale. If you don't consider it a proper sale, you've got problems. Okay. Uh, any other questions on selling chametz before we move on to Badika chametz? Any other questions? No. Okay. Right. So Badika chametz. What is it and what isn't it? Now, when I was a kid, um, what we did was, have you got your hand up, Hillary? Hang on, let me unmute you. Yes. Okay. Just want to know, I assume that we are roughly assessing the value of the liquor because we can't know exactly what yeah. we're paying for. Correct. So you it's just a, put a rough, an overall price on. Correct. It's a rough assessment of what your stuff is worth. Because remember, the non-Jew is not giving you, is not giving the rabbi all the money because he'd have to give you know, thousands of pounds for all our chametz. What he do, does is he will give a deposit of, I don't know, 100 shekel or 500 shekel, 50 shekel, whatever it is. That is a deposit, but he knows that if he wants to go to your house uh, before uh, the end of Pesach, and you have said your chametz is worth 1,000 shekels, if he goes with 1,000 shekels to you on Cholomod Pesach, then he can take all of your chametz. So he has to know more or less what he's in for. So it's important that uh, we put some kind of uh, 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 approximate value on it. Okay? Right, now, Bidikat chametz. Searching for chametz, which is done on the night before uh, Pesach. Uh, those of you who've got your Haggadah, Haggadah uh, in front of you, um, you'll find uh, that there is a bracha before we do this, uh, and which, uh, which we'll come to in a second. But the idea of Bedikat uh, Chametz is that we are searching, we're not really searching to find Chametz. What we really want to do is we want to search the house and find that there isn't any Chametz. That's the idea. Because Bedikat Chametz, the searching for Chametz, takes place almost the last thing we do before Pesach begins. It's the night before Pesach begins, by which time we should have uh, completely cleared our houses out of chametz, or the chametz that we're going to sell has been put in a designated place and locked away. And the idea of the search for chametz uh, is that we're searching to make sure that we haven't missed anything. We're not searching for the chametz. We're searching to make sure we haven't missed anything because by this time, it should all be spick and span and not have any chametz to find. Okay, that is the idea of bedikat chametz. So, you will all remember as kids, and I'm sure you probably still uh, do this. It's a very strong... <coughs> oh, could you get me... Um, a very strong minhag to wrap up some pieces of chametz <coughs> carefully and place these in the uh, various places in your house so that when you do your bedikat chametz, you actually find something. Okay? Everybody's familiar with that minhag, yeah? Okay. Now, <coughs> this is another... Uh, uh, thank you. This is another example of a uh, minhag which has, in some ways, come into disrepute. Because what happens in many households is that you put your 10 pieces of wrapped up bread in various places, you switch off the lights, you light a candle, you get a feather, and you say the bracha, which we'll come to in a minute, and then you go around and you inverted commas, find these pieces of bread 
uh, and you stick them in a bag, and that's the end of that. And that is your Badikat Khametz. Now, that is not Badikat Khametz. Not only is that not Badikat Khametz, um, we need to understand why that Minhag uh, arose in the first place. So, it's not Badikat Khametz because you haven't searched. For, what you're really meant to be doing is searching in all the places that you might have missed something. So, unless you're somebody that goes and eats your, your sandwiches on the toilet, you don't need to go and search the toilet for chametz because no chametz will be in the toilet. It's a search of chametz in a place where there might be chametz that you've forgotten. For example, at the bottom of the children's school bags, right? Mm -hmm. That is exactly the place where you need to do bidikat chametz. Uh, in the car is another place you need to do Bidikat Khametz because even though you've taken your car, well, you won't be able to do it this year, probably, uh, even though you've taken your car to the, uh, the car wash place in the canyon and, uh, uh, and they've done a super job, you don't know that they've not missed something in the little seat pocket at the back. You have to check. Uh, you have to check. That's why you have Bidikat Khametz. Bidika is a check. The word livdok means to check. So you're checking that you've not forgotten anything, that you've not missed anything. Um, so unless you're doing a proper check, you're not doing the mitzvah properly. Yes, Johnny Halpern. The bracha says be all it's not I'm the coming detail. to that. I'm coming to that in a minute. I'm coming okay. to that. Um, so, yeah, so uh, you've got to do the check properly. Now, uh, so that means you have to check mainly in the kitchen and the dining room. Uh, and, and areas where chametz is likely to be, uh, obviously those of you with little children or little grandchildren that come to your house, you've got to be even more careful because they can put stuff all over the place. Uh, uh, I, we had in our old house back in England, we had a bookcase with, uh, with a, uh, um, a, like a skirting board thing which had waves on it, it was rather pretty. Um, but it was an accumulation of all sorts of things. You take that little um, thing off, Era Pesach, and you'd find toy cars and uh, sweets that the kids had hidden there uh, so that their brothers wouldn't get hold of them and stuff like that, and all sorts of things, half-eaten biscuits right at the back. So uh, those are the kind of things that you, uh, you've you got to check. You've got to check the places where there might be chametz. That is the point of Badikat chametz. The point is not just to go around with your uh, um, candle and feather and pick up the 10 pieces that you have lost. The other thing I would just say about the 10 pieces is make sure that it's always the number 10. Because if you don't, you've got nine of them and you think, well, now I've got them all now. I must have only put nine down. And actually you've got 10 and you've forgotten where you've put them. And as you get older, that becomes more and more important because you can't remember where you put them five minutes ago. So uh, make sure that you uh, have the exact number that you put out when you've finished, that you've collected them all up. So does anybody know why um, that minhag of putting those pieces out for us to find, why that minhag came into, uh, into being? What is the point of that uh, exercise, apart from to uh, interest the kids? Johnny Halpern. Uh, I presume it's so that you can burn it in the morning. Correct. Absolutely. It ties in with the question that you just asked a minute ago. And that is the bracha. If you all have a look in your Haggadot at the, uh, at the bracha for Bedikat Chametz, you will say, you'll see that it says in, in whatever um, Haggadah you've got, the instructions will stay one way or another. Before the search, the following bracha is said. Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech Haolam, Asher Kizeshanu B'mitzvotah, V'tzivanu Al Bi'ur Chametz. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the Universe, who has sanctified us with His commandments and has commanded us to destroy. Bi'ur is destruction, to remove, destroy. Al Bi'ur Chametz, to destroy the Chametz. Now, if you have done the most wonderful Pesach cleaning job and you have uh, not left a tiny solitary scrap of chametz in your house, 
and you then go around on the night of Bidikat Chametz, and you search your house, and you look underneath the skirting boards, and behind the bookcase, and all those places, and you don't find a solitary thing, then you have nothing to destroy. You have nothing to burn. And therefore, your bracha, which you have made here, on destroying the chametz, will have been what we call a bracha levatala. It will have been a bracha, an unnecessary bracha. You've made a bracha on destroying something, and you're not destroying anything, because you've got nothing to destroy, because you've cleared it all away. So in order to make sure that the following morning we have something to destroy, and therefore we can fulfill <coughs> the mitzvah, remember it says vitzivanu, and you have commanded us to destroy it, in order that we have something to destroy, then we uh, have to put something out so that we can find it. And that was the origin of putting out the pieces of bread uh, or whatever, uh, chametz, uh, in a place so that you will find it. And therefore, you will have something which you can destroy the following morning. So it is important that we put something out. Um, uh, because uh, we're all very, very good at, uh, at cleaning our houses of chametz, and there's a decent chance that we won't find anything, and therefore we won't be able to fulfill that mitzvah. We'll have said a bracha levatala, and therefore we put these 10 pieces of bread out. It doesn't have to be 10, it can be one, it can be two, it can be five, but just make sure that you know how many you put out so that you remember to pick them all up. Okay. Um, Bedikat Chametz. Next thing on Bedikat Chametz. There is a minag, and I mentioned it just before, to use a candle and a feather. Now, why do we use a candle and a feather? Well, we use a candle because back in the day, that is how we use to get light. Okay, you can't remember Bedikat Chametz is done at night. No electricity, no lights, no gas lights. Uh, no electric lights, so therefore you have to use a, a flame, a candle, so, to cast light where you're looking. Otherwise, you're looking in the dark. So that uh, is why we use a candle. Why a feather? Well, because that was what they used to sweep things up with. If you see, uh, those of you that live around uh, Poleg Way will see our, our wonderful uh, street cleaner, Zalman, the little, little Zalman, you might see him outside shul sometimes. Uh, he cleans the streets around uh, my area. Um, sweet little man. And he doesn't use a brush to sweep the, fl the, the floor with. He uses a palm frond. Uh, I guess that's what he's been used to using. Back in the day, they didn't have brushes so much. They used feathers. The feather was a brush. So those people who do their badikat chameh, in the dark and deliberately turn off the lights and use a candle is incorrect. Please don't do that because what you're actually doing, somebody's got their uh, phone on and getting some feedback. Don't know who it is. Let's try muting all again. Okay. Um, if you do it, if you turn the lights off and you just use the flame of the candle, you're not going to get as much light as if you put the lights on. The whole idea of the candle was to give you light. So by all means, use a candle as part of the minhag to remember what our zaders and our alta zaders did back in the day. By all means, use a candle. But don't do it in the dark. Do it in the light. So the whole point is you're meant to be looking carefully to see if you've missed anything. You can't do that properly in the dark with a candle. Um, also, you want to use a feather by all means, but have with you a little hand brush because it's a lot easier to use a hand brush. By all means, use a candle and a feather, but also use the uh, conveniences that our modern world has uh, afforded us, i.e. electric lights and brushes and dust pans uh, to do the job properly. The feather and the candle is only a throwback to the minhag of pre-electricity uh, days um, use it by all means, but it's not uh, to do, don't do it in the dark uh, because you're not doing a proper job. Any questions on Badikat Chametz before we move on? Any questions? Bernard, have you got your hand up there, Bernard? Yes. Go ahead. 
you mentioned at the beginning of this that, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. You mentioned at the beginning of this that this minhag, or you suggested that it was a minhag shtus. Which particular the, bit? Of actually searching. No. Uh, Sorry if I miss on, you miss, uh, I, I, oh. I wasn't clear. What I meant was the way we do it often is incorrect because what we do is we just go around and pick up those 10 pieces with a, okay. feather, right. and a okay. uh, uh, feather and a candle uh, and we think we've done the job. We haven't, that's not correct. The minhag is to do it, uh, the, the, the correct way to do it uh, is to do it properly, to do a proper search. It's a minhag shtus, it's an incorrect minhag just to put the 10 pieces out and just go and pick those up with a candle and a feather. That's got to be part of it, but the main part of the uh, mitzvah is to actually search to make sure you've not forgotten any chametz. Sorry if I wasn't clear on that. Any other questions on Vedikat chametz? Okay, right. So the next thing is um, the following morning we have uh, something called Bior Chametz, the destruction of the Chametz. Now, um, generally speaking, that uh, is done uh, by burning. Why is it done by burning? Because by burning something, you are destroying it from the world. Uh, and that is the uh, mitzvah, is to get rid of all your Chametz, good and proper, as they say where I come from. Okay, and the way to do that is to burn it. But it doesn't have to be burnt. For example, um, there are times when we do not burn our chametz on Erev Pesach. Anyone want to tell me when that is? When do we not burn our chametz on Erev Pesach? Hands up. Paul. Paul. Yeah. When, it's, when Shabbat is Erev Pesach. Correct. When Shabbat is Erev Pesach, <coughs> when Shabbat is Erev Pesach, we can't burn our chametz because you can't light a fire on Shabbat. You can't burn anything on Shabbat. So what do we do? What do we do with our chametz er of uh, uh, Pesach when it's Shabbat? Uh, Stephen Fagin, what do we do with it? Flush it down the toilet. We stuff it down the toilet. Yeah, we flush it down the toilet. And the reason that we flush it down the toilet is because that is another way of completely destroying our chametz. Now, why am I telling you that? Because, <coughs> uh, first of all, because I want you to remember it when next time Erev Pesach is Shabbat. Uh, but no doubt somebody will tell you that when that happens. But this year, we, uh, in previous years, uh, uh, certainly in our shul and in many other uh, uh, shuls, I guess probably in snack as well, um, they, uh, we, we put uh, outside the shul Erev Pesach morning, we have a... Uh, a big, uh, what do you call it, uh, a, a cauldron thing um, uh, with a fire, and everybody comes along and burns their chametz. Uh, this year, it looks like we're not going to be able to do that, and therefore we're going to be responsible for uh, uh, for getting rid of our own chametz. Dicky, did you want to say something? No, 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 no carry okay. on. So now we're responsible for getting rid of our own chametz. Once, okay, uh, Nachum, let me unmute you. Yes, Nachum. Can't hear you. Wait a sec. Not working. Nachum. Wait, I, I wanted to know, can't you just take it and throw it outside where the animals can eat it so you don't have to flush the water away? Okay. Fair question. Fair question. Okay. So we'll come to that in a sec. Um, so this year we're responsible for getting rid of our own chametz. Those of you who are uh, fortunate enough to have a garden, uh, you can burn it in the garden. You can make your own little fire, and that's fine. Um, uh, the Rav suggested uh, the other day at his uh, shiur that you could do it on your balcony. Well, I suppose you could. Uh, you could put it, uh, do a little fire on your balcony. You might not feel comfortable doing that. Um, these things have some, uh, some ways sometimes have a, a, a habit of getting out of control. Uh, um, I once uh, burnt the chametz in my garden back in England, and I nearly set the overhanging trees on fire. Um, uh, so uh, you've got to be careful with these things. So those of you that are not comfortable with making a fire on your balcony or in your garden, um, you can flush it down the toilet. You can flush it down the toilet. Nachum is worried 
about uh, us wasting water. Well, if I can be so bold uh, as, as to, what? If I can be so bold as to suggest, um, you could do a wee first and then put it down the toilet and then you're only going to do one flush. You won't waste any water that way. Um, so, uh, so that's a solution. Uh, Nahum's other solution was just to throw it in the wind. Um, and I don't think that's a great idea because if you throw it in the wind, it's likely to blow into somebody else's garden or to somebody else's property. Um, the, the Gemara uh, does talk about uh, crumbling, it, um, crumbling it on the waters. So people used to go to the river. People used to go to the river in the Shtetlach. If there was a, usually a, a, a river nearby the Shtetlach, uh, they'd go to the river and they could, uh, they'd crumble the chametz uh, into the river and that would take it away and that would be considered as destruction. Um, so uh, my recommendation is either burn it. Uh, if you're not comfortable with burning it, you can uh, flush it down the toilet. Now, when you do so, we have a certain thing that we have to say. Now, if you turn over into on your Haggadot, the next thing after Bedikat Chametz, you'll see is Bior Chametz. We don't say another bracha because we've already said a bracha al Bior Chametz the night before when we did Bedikat Chametz. Um, so that uh, bracha, uh, when we made it, we should have had in mind, so now's the time to think about it, when you do your Bedikat Chametz and you make that bracha, Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu Al Bior Chametz, have in mind that that bracha goes on the whole process. The process begins with searching for the Chametz, finding some chametz that you've forgotten, i.e. whatever you have forgotten really, all the 10 pieces that you've, inverted commas, found. And then the second pro part of the process is the following morning when you're getting rid of it. So that bracha right at the beginning goes both on the bedika, the search, and also the bior, the destruction. So we don't say another bracha, but we do say these words. We say these words, and it's written in your uh, Haggadah in Aramaic. And it says like this. Kol chamira v'chamia de'ika birshuti, dala chamite, udala be'arite, udala yadana le, levatel ulhave hefker ka'afra de'ara. Those are the Aramaic words. Now, the reason that they are in Aramaic and not Hebrew is quite simply because the, the uh, language of the time, the lingua franca, was Aramaic. That was what people spoke. So they are making a declaration in the language that they understand. Now, we all know what that means now because we've done it before. But if I was to say those words to you uh, uh, for the first time, uh, and you weren't an Aramaic speaker, then you wouldn't have a clue what I was talking about. Uh, and therefore, you will see uh, in your Haggadot, uh, those of you who have got uh, English translation Haggadot will see an English translation, obviously. And the translation that I've got here in front of me, uh, which, by the way, is a very nice uh, uh, Haggadah, which is from the uh, Bnei Akiva uh, of Perth in Australia, which I picked up um, two years ago when I went uh, there for. Uh, Pesach is a beautiful Haggadah, and they've got a nice translation here. Any chametz or leaven in my possession, which I have not seen, which I have not removed, and which I did not know about, should be annulled and become ownerless like the dust of the earth. That is what those Aramaic words mean. Now, you are making a declaration which is saying this. I have done my best to remove all the chametz in my possession. I've done a thorough search of the kitchen. I've done a thorough search of the dining room. I've emptied the kids' school bags. I've done everything I possibly can. I've sold all the chametz, which I can't actually physically get rid of. I now have, at this moment in time, I have no chametz in my possession whatsoever. But if there's something that I've forgotten, if in some cupboard somewhere that I've forgotten, or some place, there is a little bit of chametz, there's a few crumbs somewhere, 
there's there's something I've forgotten. There was an old suitcase that I forgot to uh, I forgot to open and check, and inside there there's some chametz, whatever it is. I might have gone to England and brought back a bottle of whiskey, and I left it in the suitcase to hide it from the kids. Uh, whatever it is, I've forgotten about it, and I haven't got rid of it. From this moment on, I declare that this chametz that I've forgotten about should be ownerless. I don't own it. It's now considered to me like the dust of the earth. It's a very important catch-all uh, statement. What it means is that if you do those three things, you clean out your chametz to the best of your ability, you search to make sure you've not forgotten anything, that's one. Two, you sell the chametz that you're not getting rid of physically. And thirdly, you uh, annul anything else that doesn't fall into those two categories, then by doing those three things, cleaning out an abadika, selling what can't be got rid of, and annulling the rest, you can be absolutely certain that you have fulfilled the mitzvah of getting rid of all your chametz before Pesach. David Stern, yes, let me unmute you. Yes, um, just one, one, one other uh, option maybe to be a chametz. I heard of a custom where, for example, you could put economica. I, I lost you then, that, David. What, what, um, say that again. Pouring economica or pouring something on the food that affected, effectively made it inedible, in which case okay. it wasn't food anymore. Okay, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's another, thank you, that's another option. Uh, you can, what is chametz? If you've got a piece of bread, which is proper chametz, and you then pour uh, bleach on it, would a dog eat it? That's the, uh, that is the, um, what's the word? That's the criterion for being chametz. Something which is not ra'oi la'achilat kelev, something which is not fit for a dog to eat, is not considered chametz. And therefore, if you have some chametz that you want to get rid of before Pesach, and you can't flush it down the toilet, and you can't burn it, then as David says, you can make it so disgusting that even a dog wouldn't eat it. So by pouring bleach on it, or something like that, that would do the job, that would count. Thank you. Yes, uh, Bernard. The, bot the bottle of whiskey that you've annulled in the suitcase that you forgot to search in, can you use it after Pesach? No, it, it, it is considered like the, dust of the earth. Well, okay, it's a complicated answer actually, because what you did was you made it hefka, you, make, you made it ownerless, and then you have to then uh, uh, know the laws of hefka, of whether something, uh, something is, uh, um, something is uh, 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 what you can do, but, but it doesn't count in this case, because it would be chametz sha'avar alav apesach, even though a Jew hadn't owned it, that chametz um, was in existence over Pesach, it was ownerless, and you would have to go through all the halachot of Hefka to know whether you could use that or not. So I think the answer is you, you shouldn't use it. There may well be, I don't know, I'd have to look it up, there may well be a, a, uh, a loophole through the halachot of Hefka. Um, if anybody knows that, you could stick your hand up and help me out, otherwise I'll have to look it up. Good question. Okay. Um, uh, uh, who's got the hand up? Um, Michael Leaf. Yeah, it's not an answer to that immediate question. But re regarding the bracha that we say that on the evening before, before we do the search, you said we have in mind that we're going to destroy it the following day. Is there a time limit between making a bracha and actually carrying out the destruction? Yes, usually there is. We have to do it, what is called over la asiata. We're meant to be, do the uh, bracha immediately before we do the mitzvah. Now, in this situation, the mitzvah begins as soon as you start the search. That's part of the mitzvah. And the whole search and then the destruction the following morning is all one mitzvah. It's a bit like uh, there's a, there's a machloket um, about whether you make uh, for sfirata omer, whether you make one bracha at the beginning um, or you make a bracha every night. As you know, we Paskin that you make a bracha every night. But there is an opinion that says you only make a bracha on Sfirat Omer right at the beginning because it's all one mitzvah. 
and therefore if it's all one mitzvah, it only needs one bracha. So this, uh, the same thing applies. The bedikat chametz and the bior chametz the next day is all part of the same mitzvah. Generally speaking, we are not allowed to interrupt in the middle of doing a mitzvah. Uh, but here, because this mitzvah spans itself over a period of time, um, then you are uh, allowed to do it. You don't have to have in mind all the time you're asleep that you're doing the mitzvah of Bior Chametz. The mitzvah is, if you like, a two-part mitzvah, which uh, begins with a bedikah and finishes with the Bior. Okay? Uh, anybody else? Dicky, did you have your hand up there? No, I was just agreeing with your point. Oh, right, okay. Anyone else got uh, anything? Yes, Paul and Barbara. Yeah, um... I was just wondering what you feel about things like the contents of your vacuum cleaner, where you think that's unfit for, it, uh, for human consumption, or a dog wouldn't eat it. I'm told they're harating the breed, a special breed of dog that will eat anything, so they're happy with everything. Well, it's an it's a interesting question. Um, and, and I think, what I actually think is that you should empty your vacuum cleaner before Pesach, get the bag, and empty it into the bin. Uh, because once it's outside in the bin, it's not yours anymore. You've, you've, you've been meyaish. You've despaired of having it anymore. It doesn't belong to you. You've got rid of it. And I think you should do that before Pesach. We always certainly do. My wife is extremely um, uh, particular about uh, doing that. And I think the reason for that is that the vacuum cleaners can suck up bits of stuff, which I think a dog might eat. And you only have to go, uh, you have, you only have to go uh, around the... Uh, round the bins round here, and you'll see that there are cats picking out all sorts of stuff there. Um, um, I know a cat's not a dog, but uh, I think that it's important that you empty your uh, vacuum cleaner bag. I don't think you need to uh, bleach it out or anything like that, but I do think that you should empty it because it's, it's not w without the realms of possibility that you could have a, a little piece of, uh, of uh, bread or biscuit or something or cracker in there, which a dog would pick out and eat. Any other questions? Paul, you've got a follow-up question. Yeah. So, Nick, you mentioned about throwing things away. So here, for example, in our block, we have a chute. Are you saying if I throw my chametz down the chute into the communal bin that I've, just, I've got rid of it, I don't have to burn it? Okay. There's a problem with that uh, near to Pesach. Um, what we used to have um, in, uh, back in England, in, in Manchester, uh, it was one of the good things we had in Manchester. We had a lot of good things in Manchester. No, oh, no, not so no, good, no, but this no, was one of the good no, ones. No, what we used to have there was the council um, used to provide for us special uh, different coloured rubbish bags, uh, red bags instead of black bags. And we could put out any stuff that we couldn't. We had too much stuff to burn. We could put it out, air of Pesach, and the council would come and collect it before the time of um, before the time of getting rid of chametz, and they would take it away uh, and um, and burn it for us and get rid of it for us. Now, the reason that they, the the rabbanim right arranged that in Manchester was because the way the bins were done was that the bin stayed on your property until the day of the bin collection, when you wheeled it out uh, to the front of your path. And then the bin men came and take, took and emptied the bin. But whilst it's in your bin and on your property, there is an argument to say that it's still yours because it's on your property. Uh, and uh, would you be chuffed if somebody came into your property and started rummaging through your bins? Um, so there is a possibility that we don't consider having chucked something in the bin as getting rid of it completely. So whether to apply that concept to the chute down into the bins, uh, I, think, I, I, I think that um, it would be preferable on Erev Pesach to actually get rid of it. If you want to do that before your last collection, whenever your last collection is for your particular area, then obviously that's fine. But if it's going to stay in that, uh, stay in that bin over Chag until Cholamoid when they come and empty the bins, I think there may be uh, uh, a halachic shaila. I think bottom line is you've, you've beat, you've, you're okay, but it's not the ideal. It's not the best way of doing it. 
Uh, any other questions on Bedikat Chametz? Anyone else with that? Okay. All right. So I had in front of me over here, as you, you may be, oh, what have I done now? I've lost you all. Where are you? There you are. I, I'm not going to show it you, but you'll have to take my word for it. I have got in front of me spread out tons of papers, none of which I've ever even started to talk about yet. That's how much this. We only we've done an hour and five minutes, and um, we've not even got past B or comics. So uh, I'm going to stop here because um, uh, I'm getting tired, and probably you're also getting tired. I'll unmute you in a sec, Nechama. Um, uh, so uh, if you could just, uh, by a show of hands, tell me whether you would be interested in doing uh, another session of this uh, at some time in the future. Uh, and then uh, uh, I will arrange it. I'm not actually going anywhere, even though I've still got work to do. I'm still, okay, it looks like people are interested. Okay, so I will do that. Um, Nechama, you wanted to say something? Yeah, Sorry, if later. you can um, uh, prepare something regarding the situation is different now. How do we kosher our dishes and pots and pens and silverware in the situation that we are right now, where okay. we cannot go out. And if there are plates, let's say, that uh, were not used for 20 years and are in our possession, if I can use them for Pesach okay. or not. All right, okay. So in the next session, we'll talk about cashering the kitchen, cashering plates, what you can and can't do. Uh, okay, that's any, anybody else got any? I mean, I've better write these things down, haven't I? Hang on a minute. Um, okay, cashering plates. Oh, we're, we're up already. Uh, yeah, uh, Hillary. Medicines. What about medicines? Them? Well, like things that you'd keep in the fridge normally. Um, like, okay, let me answer that. Like let me answer that one now. Um, any tablets that you have, some of them do contain starch and do have chametz, but they are not ra'ui la'achilat kelev. You would not find the dogs eating your pills. So therefore, anything which is in tablet form, you do not need to worry about. The only right. things you need to be concerned about in terms of medicine are liquid medicines that taste nice. So the stuff that yeah. you, you, you give to kids, Calpol and Akamol and all that gear, um, right. some of them do contain chametz and they would be Royal Khilad Kelev because they taste nice and if you put some on the floor, a dog might lick it up. So okay. uh, the, in terms of tablets, you have nothing to worry about at all. In terms of medicine, if it tastes nice, you need to find out uh, what's in it. The, the, right. there, is, the, there is available, uh, certainly in the UK, and I can probably get hold of an up-to-date one if anybody needs it, um, a list of medications which um, uh, contain uh, proper chametz uh, and are problematic. So if anybody's got any uh, questions, you send me an email with the name of the medicine that you are no, worried no, no, about. No, no. But it does not apply to tablets. Tablets are, you don't have to worry about at all. I'm going to put my hand um, Yes, Anita. England, the rubber not have come out with easing up on some of the uh, laws and restrictions for Pesach. For example, if uh, people can't get out and get fresh meat mm -hmm. or fish, they can use the one that's still in their freezer and uh, tea, coffee, that kind of thing. Have the rubber not here come up with anything like that? Okay, uh, I'll, uh, again, I, I'm conscious of the time and I'm conscious that I'm getting weary. Um, so I will address that uh, as well uh, next time. Uh, okay. Okay, it's different here in Israel. Uh, it's easier here in Israel, but I'll address that next time. Uh, Bernard. Oh, sorry. Well, actually, I, I, I just want to know, is the Rav going to, um, are we going to sell our Homets online? Yes, the way the Rav is going to do it this year is he is going to ask you to send him an email with your name, your address, your, um, your phone number, the place where you're keeping your chametz, so you'll say cupboard in the kitchen, um, and the approximate value. 
by sending him that email, that is considered to be a Kinyan. That's, you're giving him permission to do it on your behalf. Uh, normally, you would want to do some kind of act of Kinyan, so raising up uh, an article, uh, but that uh, is an, uh, an, an added thing which is not, not today considered necessary given our circumstances. The Rav will sell your Hametz uh, by you sending him an email to do it. I understand that Chabad also offer an online sale service. Uh, uh, and uh, if you feel so inclined to, uh, to you avail yourself of that, that is available as well. Okay, thank Johnny? you. Yes. Johnny? Yes, Johnny. It might, sound, it might sound a silly question. I don't mean it to be. If one is making Pesach for two people this year only, are there any different situations or... Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We've never done it for two before. Well, it's, I guess it's uh, theoretically the the the, uh, the preparation for Pesach. I mean, in other words, getting rid of all your chametz is exactly the same. Um, right. But obviously, you know, the quantities of uh, of fried fish that you will need will be far less. Uh, right. but the, the, the preparations in terms of getting rid of the chametz is going to be exactly the same. Right. And what about on the night, though? Okay, we're going to yeah. talk about that eventually oh. uh, on another okay. session. Okay. Any more for any more? Yes, Helen. No, no, I'll just say goodbye. Oh, right, okay. Bye bye, Helen. Any more for any more? Let me just see if there's any more hands up. Uh, okay. Oh, yes, Dickie's got his hand up. Yes, Dickie. Just to thank you for a wonderful lecture. Yes. Yeah. No, a lot of explanation, none of which uh, we all had. Some of it's got to be new and we will value it. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Okay, what I would like to suggest, okay, Johnny Halpern. Just would he talk about Zoom cameras next week? Zoom okay. cameras on Zoom cameras on Seder night. Yes. Okay. So many stories going around. Yeah. Okay. I think that's important to discuss. Um, Thank you. All right. Um, okay. So we'll call it a day for now. Um, depending on how much work I manage to get done today, uh, I might do one tomorrow morning. Um, because if there is so much material to get through, we could do one a day till now, till Pesach, and we still won't get it through. So depending on how much work I get through today, if I manage to get through enough, and uh, we can, uh, I'll set one up. Uh, so watch out for the email and the WhatsApp later on today. If I'm going to do it, I'll send you the link later on tonight. Okay? Wonderful. All right. Bye. I'm going to unmute you all so you can all say goodbye to everybody. Right, you're all unmuted. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you.